Hey guys, welcome back for part two of our discussion with Elizabeth Harrison Telstra, who is a former professional ballet dancer turned physical therapist. So if you missed the first part of this interview where we talk about Elizabeth's background and we start to really get into that journey of being a professional dancer into a physical therapist, identity, and much more than that, go ahead and go back to part one and watch that. And now, if you're ready, we're going to go right into part two. Let's talk a little bit about um, how do you think, like if, if we could create the ballet world in the future, how do you think that the ballet world could be more supportive of dancers? Now, I know that, that there's a lot <laughs> it can do, <laughs> but let's just hear some of your ideas. More supportive of dancers. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stick to the PT element first, okay. since that is my professional space. Yeah, and I love hearing you talk about it. Though I, I might, I have yeah. other opinions as well. <laughs> um, well, first and foremost, and I mentioned this this morning on that interview that you said that you caught a little bit of, um, mm -hmm. I would love to see cross-training be a part of a dancer's work day and be uh, paid for it, right? Yes, yes. Because, I mean, other other high-level athletes, other professional sports are. <laughs> they they yeah. are paid to not only do games and, um, I was going to say rehearsals, <laughs> practices, <laughs> um, but also to train as a team. And um, they have a lot of um, resources given to them to utilize, whether it's nutritionists and athletic trainers, physical therapists, massage therapists, whatever, they, they kind of have those, those tools. I, I think that we, that professional ballet companies, professional dance companies um, should prioritize um, the, providing those elements to the dancers. And we're doing a better job of that. We're, we're seeing that happening more and more. Mm -hmm. um, but yet it's still often difficult for the dancers to actually utilize mm -hmm. those resources because it has to be on their own time mm -hmm. or it has to be on their own dime mm -hmm. or, you know, there's, um, I know um, I did an internship with Boston Ballet and they do, they have a dancer health fund which is a fund that essentially each dancer has, I don't know how much money, let's say a thousand dollars to yeah. use for cross training, massage therapy, you know, um, tape mm -hmm. or a foam roller or, you know, some stuff to take care of their body. Yeah. Um, and not all companies have something like that. So dancers have to, to use their own money, which they already don't get paid enough. <laughs> um, we all know that. Um, and then they're expected to spend money on taking care of their body. Um, and that's just hard. And that's why it doesn't, it doesn't happen. You know, right. um, if you're pinching pennies, you're not going to, you're going to prioritize rent. You're not going to prioritize massage therapy. Um, Oftentimes. Um, so I, I would love to see those resources really prioritized that the company invests and raises money so that they can give those resources to the dancers. Um, I think I would love to see cross training happen in their eight hour workday. Um, so if their day starts at nine and ends at six, they have ballet class and then they have, you know, six hours of rehearsal. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to see at least 30 minutes of that day. I would love an hour and it doesn't yeah. even have to be every day. Maybe it's just three days a week of organized cross training, maybe, you know, weights one day, mm -hmm. cardio another, you know, it, it could look a variety of ways, but in their work day, mm -hmm. as opposed to they dance for eight hours and then they're expected to cross train. Well, that leads to overuse injuries. That leads to tissue breakdown. That's too much. Right. Um, already eight hours a day is more than any, any most other professional athletes have to do. 
because science shows that that's too much. <laughs> right. Um, and that's why 75% of dancer injuries are overuse injuries. Wow. wow. 75%. That's amazing. Which, in my opinion, means it's a training issue. Yeah. Overtraining. Right. And we're not prioritizing rest time. We're not prioritizing using the muscles in a different way. Mm. So rest doesn't have to be, be sitting on the couch. It could actually mean strengthening your internal rotators, resting those external rotators, or yeah. just cross training. And cross training means you're moving your body in a different way than what your sport asks you to do. Right. Um, so you're balancing the joints out because if, if ballet typically uses the external rotators, then we're going to strengthen the internal rotators. We're going to work in parallel. We're going to, right. we're going to do the opposite of what you're doing all day so that your body is more balanced. Um, if right, we, I remember, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I remember before when we were talking, we were talking about the importance of varied movement, right? And talked a little bit about um, how doing the same movement over and over and over again, or just well, it, it leads to, to overuse injuries. Um, and essentially, so training tissue, we want to, there's often tissue breakdown and that leads to strengthening. So that's good. Tissue breakdown is okay. If we, if we, do something and we're a little sore, our muscles are sore because we worked hard and we maybe did some weightlifting or something. Mm -hmm. uh, that soreness is because you had some micro trauma in the tissues. There okay. was, there was damage at a, at a microscopic level. Mm -hmm. Um, and which is okay. That's, that's good. As long as you then give yourself time to rest so that those tissues can rebuild and get stronger. So that the next time you do it, you're a little bit stronger. You break them down again, you give it rest and you get a little bit stronger, you break them down again. You give it rest, you get a little bit stronger. That's how you progress. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, if you do the same movement, movement over and over again, every single day, all day long, um, whether maybe that's just plantar flexion. So pointing the ankle you point the ankle how many times a day as a dancer. Right. And that is going to wear on some of those tissues that are stressed with that motion. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that's hard to get around just because of how often you do have to point your ankle. Right. Um, sometimes there are some exercises that you can do and things that you can do to balance that joint out so that there is less stress on those same tissues every single day. Um, so it's, it's, you know, that it's, wouldn't, that wouldn't be like pointing into a TheraBand then. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and we right. recommend it so often, right? So let's take a rest to build our ballet muscles by doing more pointing. <laughs> right, exactly. Let's stop doing that and let's do clamshells and TheraBand exercises, right? Turn out and pointing the ankle. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so a lot of times it's not, it's not going to look like that. In fact, I have to tell when we do jump training, I often have to tell dancers like, stop pointing your feet. <laughs> like, like, so hard. <laughs> because when we're, when we're actually like in actual jump training, yeah. um, the muscles that should be working the hardest to propel you into the air are like glutes, glute max. Right, yeah. And then secondly, quads. Mm. Third, in last place, the foot and ankle. Right. Yeah. We do it the opposite as ballet dancers. True. We tend to jump with our feet. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't do it enough, we might use our quads and then maybe our glutes, right? Right. No wonder we have overuse injuries of the foot and ankle because the little FHL muscle that's like very small is trying to do the work of glute max. Wow, yeah. It's trying to propel your body weight into the air when it should be one of your largest muscles in the body, glute max. Um, so oh, I love that so much because, um, so I would love to hear more about gym training because I think, and I have tried as a, as a teacher 
as I learn more of, of getting kids to jump with the relaxed feet, just to get that feeling of, of getting the pelvis up, right? Um, using your butt. Uh, but yeah, so I would love to hear more about that because I do think so often we are taught that it is the push of right. the floor, right? Which is part of it, for sure. Which is part of it. And, and, and in, in Petit Allegro, oftentimes that's all you got, right? Because right. it's, yeah, it's, it's so, so fast. fast, you don't have time to plie and really drop your butt down and right. use your, you know, so I, I, we have to understand that. But Grand Allegro, you are going into a big torgete or something. Um, if you have done jump training, so I always like to say, like the jump training programs that I do don't often look like dancer jumps initially. They look more like squats and lunges so that we can work on getting the glutes involved in the jump, which means you're going to start in that squat position with your butt sticking out, which dancers don't mm -hmm. like to do. You know, they like to keep their butt safe underneath them, like okay. a, you know, like plie. Right. But yeah. I want them to get your knees behind your toes, sit, send your butt, butt behind you uh -huh. so that you're in that squat position so that your glute max is in the prime position to propel you into the air when you jump. And if we start to train that glute max to kick in with that, with jumping, mm -hmm. we're going to start to see that translation into the Grand Allegro, which is why typically we, I go from squats and lunges and things like that into things that typically look more dance related so that we can st start to connect the dots. Okay. That same feeling I had when I jumped into the air, doing that PT exercise, that's, I want to feel that in my body when I do this torgete. Gotcha. And so starting to connect the dots in that way. Mm. Um, so a, a lot of times it is, it's working outside of dance mm. yeah. in a way to train the body and see how something feels, strengthen a muscle in a safe and appropriate way so that when you're in ballet class and you're turned out and you can't stick your butt out, your right. glutes are like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. I know how to help assist. And um, then so you're yeah. high enough that adding that point of the foot is actually much easier. <laughs> yes. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's easier to point my foot because I'm in the air. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that's huge. So that, that brings us back to why it would be so wonderful. And, you know, dance companies probably aren't listening, but if they are, <laughs> for them to start putting cross training into the dancers' day, and for for uh, studios too, right? For students to yep. start learning that that's part of the process. Absolutely. I would also love to see like an anatomy class be required <laughs> for teachers, for, for teachers, for students, <laughs> for um, students. Because a lot of the, a lot of the anatomy training that students get is from their teachers, right? Are from their teachers, <laughs> um, and the anatomy that they get is not always correct, right? Yeah, right. Totally. So there's no prerequisite for um, that I know of, unless you're in a certain. I know there's there's certain um, uh, styles and training techniques and right, right. But but. For being a teacher. For being a teacher of a certain technique or a, of a certain style. Right. Um, you know, but, but there's not a prerequisite of you have to have taken an anatomy class to teach. Right. Um, and and that's, that's okay because it's not about understanding the anatomy to be a good ballet teacher, but it's confusing for young dancers if they're getting input that isn't actually correct. Right. Um, like some of the big ones are that your glutes do turn out. Right. Okay. Like your glutes assist with turnout. There are some fibers of glute max and <laughs> some fibers of glute need that are in the right position to assist with external rotation of the hip. Right. But that's not their main job. They need right. to focus on hip extension and stabilizing the pelvis and the things that the glutes actually do. And then your piriformis and obturator internus and superior and inferior gemelli and the muscles that actually do external rotation, right. 
will do external rotation. Right. So um, if we're teaching dancers that you have to squeeze your butt to have good turnout, mm -hmm. then that's very confusing because that's not really correct. <laughs> right. And, and once you squeeze your butt, it's hard to go back, right? It's almost like a retraining process that I've gone through and then I continually work on and also work on with my students, but I still have a lot of students be like, well, that is in direct opposition to everything everyone else is saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, it's, yeah. but it's really, it's one of those um, breakthrough moments, right? I remember the moment that I learned to use my butt for jumping. I remember the moment I learned not to use my butt for turnout. And let me just tell you, everything was so much easier, <laughs> right? Um, yes. I feel like the, the reason that I'm really passionate about students and of course teachers and professionals taking anatomy is because as I'm trying to learn it now as an adult, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm working backwards where I'm like, man, this would have been so good to know. <laughs> and, um, I, I wish I had known this, you know, 15 years prior or, you know, why didn't I think to ask the questions that I'm asking now? Um, yeah. dancing would have been very different. And, and it's why it is different for me now than it was when I was dancing professionally. And it's, it's harder in some ways because I'm not prioritizing that type of movement anymore, right. but, I, but it's easier in other ways because I know how to access that movement. I know what muscles do that motion right. and, and therefore I'm more efficient with what I'm doing as opposed to just squeezing everything because I'm not really sure what actually, what right. muscle actually does that motion. Right. Um, I think, yeah, I think understanding the anatomy is so important um, right. as a dancer and, and as a teacher, right. uh, you're right. responsible for educating your students and right. making sure that you are giving them the right information, which is why, I mean, teacher, teachers like you are so ideal because you're so curious and you're so right. willing to evolve and adapt and change and challenge things. Um, yeah. I think that's not always the case, you know, ballet. Well, I always did it this way and it worked fine for me. Mm -hmm. um, that mentality, I mean, I get that. I get that mentality, but, but there's not, it doesn't encourage evolution and progress. Yeah. Um, so really being curious and asking questions, both as a dancer and as a teacher, right. um, you know, a, we all need to, I know I am every day being like, whoa, I need to understand that more. And I need to understand that more. Yeah. And that's something I really don't have a good grasp on. You know, there's so many things that I am researching and learning and I will never know everything. Right. Um, I think it's important that dancers know that and teachers know that about themselves too. I don't know everything. So I might go read this article and see if what I'm teaching is actually Correct, and if not, right. maybe I'll adapt. Right. Uh, it's not, you know, it's okay. You know, I, I already, I haven't been practicing an incredibly long amount of time as a physical therapist, but I already have evolved the way I'm teaching certain things because I've learned that how I was teaching it when I first right. started practicing was not the best way and it's not serving my patients as well as, and probably, 10 years from now, oh, yeah. I'll be teaching how I'm teaching stuff now. Um, that's yeah. just part of growing. Yeah, that's life. I mean, that is part of growing and learning. And, and I think like what you're saying, that's so important as, as people, right? As um, teachers and physical therapists and dancers, just to be curious and, and more playful with that learning. I think that ballet can kind of uh, lend itself to being kind of very rigid, very serious, very early. And it can kind of, it feels very black and white, right? For a lot of people. Yeah. And I think the more that we can like lift that a little bit and breathe some air into it so that it can be more of a curious, playful, like experiment of movement, um, not only the better for the professional world, I believe, but also just to open it up really, because I work with a lot of adults or late starters, people who either danced before or have always wanted to dance. And 
I think that ballet can be kind of very intimidating, very all or nothing. Like we talked about ballet over everything, right? You have to eat, sleep, breathe it. <laughs> and that's just not true. <laughs> and it can actually be so beautiful if you have a multi-dimensional experience of life where ballet is part of it. It will make you a better person and a better person. And I actually heard um, an interview with an, a, an artistic director at a ballet company recently, and he was saying, I actually, I actually look for dancers who have interests outside of dance because that means that they're bringing a whole person to the table and they're going to know how to um, pull from different experiences and really emotionally get into the role and emotionally get into their dancing. And if a lot of times if you eat, sleep and breathe dance or ballet, um, you don't have those types of experiences that you get outside and, and that affects your artistry or it could affect your artistry. Um, I don't know. Yeah. it's 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 important for your health and your mental capacity space right and for your dancing I think it's hugely important um and I think that we're by encouraging education while we're dancing we're starting to encourage that idea of interest outside of dancing and um though it, we need to work on that still it's for it's sure still, <laughs> very like if you have other interests yeah you're not devoted yeah. to, to ballet right which i think right it's ridiculous i i i am really encouraged i see more and more examples of um dancers who are showing their their um multiple passions outside of dance i'm really encouraged to see how much experimentation there is in the dance world and and what performing is, what being professional is. And that's why I really wanted to bring you on because I, I think it's so important. A couple, well, we talked about a lot of important things, but I just wanna highlight um, the importance of not being all or nothing in ballet and seeing how every piece of your life supports ballet and ballet supports your life and creating that kind of a relationship. And then also just how, how you've created this success in physical therapy that is so needed by the dance world, right? To have doctors and physical therapists who know what it is to work as a dancer, to know the demands on a dancer so that you can really help um, the next generation because Sometimes we see, um, you know, success as one thing, but when we broaden that scope, we can bring so much more than we ever even knew was possible. I'm sure you have helped so many dancers. I know the role of a physical therapist for a dancer is like <laughs> amazing. I mean, I remember one physical therapist that I had, she was just like, uh, my favorite person ever, right? <laughs> you spend so much time with them. You're in a really vulnerable place if you're an injured dancer. And, um, and, and they're encouraging you and supporting you in a way that you're really not getting from the dance world. <laughs> that, that is I think, maybe something that made me, um, I, I was the most attracted to that aspect of physical therapy that relationship building. Um, you know, I, I considered medical school, I considered becoming a physician assistant, things that, um, I, you know, but, I, but I, did, I knew I wouldn't have that relationship with the patient. I wouldn't be able to spend as much time with them. And that was what was so helpful for me when I was dancing. Mm -hmm. um, that psychology component, you know, there is such a huge, psychological component of injury. Yes. Um, and I am not a, a psychotherapist. I am not a therapist and I do not pretend to be, but I do believe that the mental, um, uh, if there is mental turmoil or mental stuff going on, it's gonna affect the physical and right. vice versa, right? right? 
you have an injury that's keeping you from doing what you love, it's going to affect you mentally. Right. Um, and so we, you, you have to address both. You have to be open um, about, you know, open and honest with yourself about both. Um, and I have referred people to other resources, whether it be counseling or, um, you know, psychotherapy or nutritionist, or, you know, I'm, I'm not going to treat you outside of my scope, but I can, I can maybe help you figure out how to, um, find what you need while you are in this recovery process with your injury. Right. You can be that voice that helps to point out avenues of help, right? Which is, is another area that the ballet world could improve upon Absolutely. where a lot of times injured dancers are just kind of treated as get out of the way. Right. right. There's the next the one. <laughs> yeah. Right. Disposable. That's the word I was looking yeah. for. Well, um, well, and being an advocate for the dancer, I think that's what I love maybe most is mm -hmm. that I have a platform now that I did not have when I was a dancer. Um, to advocate for the dancer, right? I, I really feel strongly that, you know, I, I, I'm doing what I do for the dance community, but mostly I'm doing it for the dancer that's in front of me and I'm doing it for future dancers. Um, I, you know, I, I love, you know, I work closely with the National Ballet Company and I will tell you, my loyalty is to the dancers and their well-being, right? Less so to the ballet company. And that says nothing about the ballet company and how I feel about national ballet. But I just think it is important that right. the dancers have an advocate um, who is concerned for their well-being before the well-being of the organization, because other people in the organization have other things to prioritize and the health right. of the dancer may not be their priority is right. not their priority. Right. Yeah. Um, it's important to them. So they say, but you know, <laughs> right. it, it's, they have to keep a business alive. They have other things to yeah. prioritize. Right. And I think it's important that my priority be the dancers and their health um, and not necessarily the organization. And I, and I felt that from my PT, I felt that like she really cares about me, not right. the fact that I'm doing this role. Right. She cares about me as a person. Right. Um, and I just, I think that's important to, right. for a dancer to have that. Right. You as the rest of your life, right? Not just as you getting back in time for this performance. You as a human being. <laughs> right. Yes. As a whole that, person. That is so important because um, I remember having thoughts as a dancer of, well, you know, if I shred my hip and I got to have to have a hip replacement at 30, who cares? As long as I get this spot right now. <laughs> We've all said oh, things. Yeah. We've all thought things like that. Um, and, and people are going to continue thinking things like that, no matter how much we educate them. But, um, but I think the more that we can create that whole picture, right? Yes. That whole picture of who you are as a person, all of the parts of you that work together. Yes. Yeah. Dancers like to really segment and, um, and not connect, like you were saying, the mental affecting the physical, um, and the physical. Or the, fact, or the fact that there is a life after dance, right? right? Dancers are rarely thinking about that they will live to be elderly and what is their body going to look like then right. you know yeah. like it doesn't matter as long as i can perform now well right. as the ptm like but it does matter exactly. i would like you to be able to walk when you're 40. Yeah. <laughs> because 40 right. is not that far away oh my goodness right um yeah and and reminding i mean i remember working, talking to one of the boston ballet dancers and and she was kind of saying, well, as long as I can do this and as long as I can get a couple more years da, 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 of dancing. And I said, well, what, what about as long as you can walk when you retire? <laughs> and she kind of looked at me like, oh, that's probably yeah, I think I want to do that too. <laughs> Oh and I'm like, God. okay, so that is my goal as well as keeping you dancing. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh my goodness. Because you are okay. still going to be a person after you retire and you're going to need to be able to move your ankle. It's those, it's those blinders that we put on yeah. as dancers. And again, I think it comes back to that whole idea of like ballet over everything where really that's not supportive. Yeah. So Elizabeth, I would love for you to tell us if ballet is still a part of your life. Obviously it is, and then the fact that you work with dancers, you work with the Nashville Ballet, so you're seeing ballet dancers all the time. But what about you, do you still dance? Um, I do. Um, not as often as I would like, to be honest. Um, I, have, I have thought about this recent, more recently and talked to my husband about this, that something I wanna prioritize in the coming years is my own dancing. How often do I want to be able to make it to class um, and and prioritize that time? And then do I want to perform again? I miss performing. Um, and so I don't know what that would look like. You know, I, I have a full-time job and that full-time job often has lots of supplemental things outside of that. So yeah, time is definitely an issue. Um, but, um, I, I would love to do more dancing and I would love to, to, to perform again in some capacity. I don't know what that looks like, but currently I am, I, I do take class when I can. I take community division classes, adult classes. Um, uh, typically, sorry, my dog is very excited right now. For no some reason. So <laughs> he's making noises and sneezing. No um, so I, I usually do ballet class and contemporary. Mm. Um, and ballet is just so familiar to my body. Um, and I get something from that that's nostalgic and um, grounding. Mm. Um, I will say that it was not always like that when I transitioned from dancing professionally into school and kind of other things. Uh, it was very stressful for a period of time because my, my body was different and um, things moved different and weren't as easy. It wasn't as easy as it used to be. Um, but now I give myself more grace. And if I mess something up and I fall out of turn, I laugh at myself. I find myself laughing a lot in class. People probably <laughs> look at me like I'm crazy, but I would rather laugh than cry. And I used to do more crying. <laughs> and now I would rather laugh. Um, so ballet class just looks different to me because of the things that I emphasize more. I, I want to move. I want to, I want to move my body and it's not about how tight can my fifth be and how high can my leg be. Mm -hmm. I don't care how tight my fifth is anymore. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, but I can, in my very not tight fifth, <laughs> I can do some pretty excellent port de bras, right? right, right. <laughs> so yeah. it's just, prioritizing different things and um and then contemporary class I love love I love I've always loved contemporary movement because I feel like I can actually there is no right or wrong the teacher that I take from is wonderful about kind of just this is the choreography but if you feel like doing something different there then do right. it you know so yeah. it's okay if you want to make it your own and I think that that's a really important part of dance mm -hmm. you know dance is moving your body and doing what feels best and I feel like ballet can sometimes stifle the dancer in you because right. it's so right or wrong and so perfectionistic. And, and, you know, I, I don't, I, when I was in my ballet training days, I did not know how to just dance or, you know, improvisation was I, that's what I was going to bring up. <laughs> like, like, yeah. I hated improv, right? Same. but I have taken some improv classes and workshops since retiring and I love them because I I'm I'm not whole, critiquing myself the whole time and I can just play with movement and see how it feels and be right. less worried about how it looks and um so um and I would love to do kind of more I'm playing with the idea of a hip-hop class I think that would be super fun uh, yes I'm also not I'm, I haven't I'm not brave enough <laughs> yet. <laughs> That's on my um, list too. So maybe we'll just have to keep each other. Yeah. Well, I've <laughs> thought about doing like a, a hip hop class during this. A Zoom one. Yeah. I know, right? 
And I don't know why that bothered me. You talked about this earlier today on one of your posts, how Ooh. critical we are of ourselves yeah, right. and how we don't want to, you know, put ourselves out there and just move right. people because we're ashamed or whatever. Um, I, I think that has definitely has something to do with it. The perfectionist in me is like, I am not a hip hop dancer and I'm going to look like an idiot. So yeah. I don't want to do it in front of other people. Right. right. Yeah. I'll, I'm working on that. Hopefully I'll make it <laughs> sometime soon. <laughs> Yes, I, I totally agree with the improv thing. I think now um, there is a little bit more improv that is put into training, which I think is great. Yeah. When we were dancing, no. And I remember um, the first couple of experiences with improv were just terrifying where I was like, I hate this. <laughs> yeah, I hate this and I don't want to do this and this is stupid. Because you're so used to I have that mentality. Told how to move right exactly in ballet you're told exactly how to move yeah, and yeah. um and i and i know that is part of ballet so i know that that's there but i do agree that being able to find your own rhythm and find the way that your body wants to move will actually help your ballet training and everything so. absolutely <laughs> oh my goodness yeah uh i oh no hold on i lost my Um, what were we talking about? Um, what were we talking about? We were talking about being nervous, um, improv, oh. being yeah, nervous yeah. to put yourself out there, judgmental. Oh, I know what it is to say. Um, I have kind of a vision that I'm working towards but it does feel very counterculture to ballet because ballet is so specific. But like in a yoga class, you know how they'll, they'll be giving a sequence and they'll say, you know, maybe you do this, maybe you don't, maybe you get here, maybe you don't, and it's all fine. And when I first started taking yoga as a, a ballet dancer, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna level up. Of course I am. Like yeah, yeah. it is a competition. I'm not gonna do this. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and I know, like, I try to infuse that into my teaching now, where, where I'll say, you know, like, maybe you relevate, maybe you don't, maybe you know, you let go of the bar, maybe you bring this higher, maybe you don't. And I know a lot of dancers automatically translate into less, better, right? And I, I just think it's so important that we start to separate that because we're not then really communicating and listening to our bodies and working with them. Absolutely. We're maybe not doing what's best for our body. We're doing what is impressive and what the person next to us is doing. Right. I'll tell you, um, yoga was really humbling for me when I, I did not do a bunch of much yoga while I was dancing. I'm ashamed to say I was not good at cross training, hence all the injuries I had. Um, but I started yoga after I retired, fell in love with the teacher, um, mm -hmm. Jillian St. Clair here in Nashville. She was a dancer as well. So she understands kind of that dancer mentality and body. And mm -hmm. um, she was really helpful to me because she would say things that, you know, it's not about what the person next to you is doing. It's not about the shape you're making. Right. It's about doing what your body needs. And I could see, I, I could feel her, whether she was or was not directing some of those comments at me because my leg was going super high in downward dog, you know, lift that leg up. I was opening the pelvis and just cranking my leg up instead of keeping it closed and actually using my glute to lift. Um, and I was, I was doing the hardest version of everything that she gave. Right. Um, it took time for me in my yoga practice to say, okay, this isn't about being impressive and it's not about proving yourself and it's not about what the person next to you is doing or the shape that you're making. This is about self-care. This is about doing what your body needs right. and paying attention to that. I had no idea how to even 
listen to what my body needs right and then be okay with doing a modification that took time too don't right. be ashamed for doing a modification it doesn't mean you're right. weaker it means right. potentially that you're smarter because right. yeah. you're choosing an option that's best for your body and right. that that took a while for me to be okay yeah. with i feel like just now i can take a yoga class and not do a headstand and not do all the crazy fancy stuff because i'm not right. physically ready for it and be okay right. with that Right. And not have it like affect your ego. I know that was a real journey for me as well, but so healing. And to me, that's, what's really given me this vision for what ballet can be. Because I think a lot of people leave the, the dance world with a bad taste in their mouth, right? There's a lot mm -hmm. of toxic elements. There's a lot of um, negative and detrimental things that happen. Yeah. But ballet is also very beautiful, and I believe that it can be extremely therapeutic. Um, so the more that we can kind of extract all of those beautiful life-giving elements of ballet and then kind of present them in that way where it's a tool, right? It's a tool to help you learn more about your body, to help you express emotion to help you build muscle too um yeah. but but yeah that's just you know i think ballet can be so much more i think i think that is hugely important and i think that starting that at a young age is also important because changing yeah. that mindset in an older dancer is an, is very challenging mm -hmm. but if we start talking that way with our younger dancers and yeah. encouraging you know, listening to your body and, 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 and I know that that looks different with kids than it does with adults, but, but we need to play with ways to encourage the positive aspects of ballet because right. you're right. There's a lot of negativity and there's, I probably know more people who've retired from the dance world with a negative taste in their mouth than a positive one. Right. Um, which is unfortunate and that's sad. It doesn't it have to be that sad. way. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm very passionate about creating a new ballet culture that is based on all of the positive aspects. I think that um, the more that, sorry, I'm just hearing them sing to my daughter. It's her fifth birthday. Um, but yeah, I think the more that we can shine the light towards all of the beauty in all of the positive aspects and then have people that really come alongside and, um, <laughs> so super distracting. <laughs> they're like screaming right outside the window. Okay. <laughs> um, that's good. It's um, social distancing, birthday singing from the neighbors. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the more that we can come and, like you said, really start from the young people and start to make that change there, but then also have people that come alongside um, our our older dancers, our professionals. To, to be that support, to be that voice pointing out um, that it can change and that it can be different. Um, I think so many dancers can feel stuck in ballet, right? Because it, it becomes really heavy, um, but also they don't know anything else. It comes back to what you're saying about the importance of education, the importance of having other interests, because when we get to a place where Ballet is not fulfilling us, but we feel like we have to stay. I mean, in any situation, that's not good, but we just see it again and again, I think. In Absolutely. Ballet. And, and oftentimes, it's when, in my experience, not always, it's been um, when there's not a balance in life. So when there's that eat, sleep, and breathe mentality, that's the mentality where you're going to get burned out eventually. Right. Right. Um, so having interests outside of dance is potentially going to make your dance career better and longer and more fulfilling. fulfilling yeah, Absolutely. more inspiring. I think that really translates as well to the audience. Um, yeah, I just, okay. So, well, <laughs> we could talk forever and we will, we will just have to have you on again because I love to hear the physical therapist brain and to hear the actual science, the actual anatomy is so fascinating to me. Um, 
So I just want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of your experience and knowledge with my audience. And let's talk about where people can find you. So yes, your Instagram handle and um, your, do you have a website? Work, working on that. Yeah, almost. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and I'll, yeah, I'll put, I'm going to put everywhere to find you online in the description box. Perfect. But um, the easiest way for someone to find you would be? Um, probably my Instagram handle, per, just personal message me, which is yeah. um, Elizabeth underscore physio. Mm -hmm. um, and, and or my email, which is Elizabeth dot h dot tilstra at gmail.com um okay. and, and just send me a message if you have a question if you are interested in a consult anything like that um right. i'm happy to to help right. and i will i'm working on a website it Perfect. is in process yeah um i will let you know when it is ready i understand how difficult that is. <laughs> <laughs> i have my website that pretty much needs a lot of help but um <laughs> but it's out there and that's so great that's one of the great um aspects of the internet and having the internet during this time is that people who aren't even in nashville can get a consultation from you through zoom and work with you wherever they are and again i'll just reiterate that i really encourage all of you dancers whether you are recreational or on the pre-professional track, whether you just started, even if you don't have a great um, knowledge yet of ballet, it's great to start at the beginning, talking to a physical therapist, kind of getting a uh, physical assessment and getting exercises. I actually think that getting those physical therapist uh, evaluations and exercises and focusing on that more than just ballet classes during this time would be the best use of your time. So whether it's Elizabeth or someone else that you know, I, I definitely highly recommend Elizabeth um, just getting in touch with physical therapists and getting that, um, all that knowledge that they have to share. So. Thank you so much for having me. This has been really fun. I could talk about this stuff all day. Long. I know, obviously. <laughs> we could never be finished, but that's, that's the beauty of it. And I think these conversations are so important. Every time that I kind of talk about these things, the mental aspects or the burnout or whatever, I'm amazed at the amount of messages that I get. So I think it's really important for dancers to know that they're not alone and that they're is options, right? There's okay. lots of different ways to come at, come at the, whatever they're dealing with. So. Absolutely. All right. I love, I love what you're doing. I love all that you're putting out there. I love how you're challenging the way the dance world works and thinks and, um, and really making dancers think in ways that I don't remember anybody making me think when I was dancing. And I think that that is so important. Um, right. And, and, vital for changing changing people's experiences in ballet so that they're mostly positive um, right. and I think that I think what you're doing is really wonderful oh, thank you so much that means a lot um, I'm so grateful to have met so many wonderful people throughout my ballet experience and so to be able to reconnect with you even though we barely knew each other, just passing through in Joffrey, um, to be able to just kind of see the paths that different people have taken um, is really inspiring. And I also wanted to highlight that for those people who are pre-professional right now to, to see how those different career paths can look. And I think the dance world needs more physical therapists who are dancers. <laughs> <laughs> there's no, there's no wrong path. I think that's, so important to to remember that you know right. I remember stressing about every move I made and would it be detrimental or helpful to my career you know you can always change it nothing's nothing's permanent you know you 100%. go one place for a year and you don't love it and then you go somewhere else or right. you know you decide you don't like dancing anymore and you stop dancing for a year and then you decide you miss it and then you can just start yeah. back I mean there's so many people who have 
done that. And oh, man, there's no. no right or wrong. It's just your journey. If that's right. what it is. And the more that you could be open to it, I think the more that it flows, right? Because um, I never would have thought that I would have the experiences that I have in the life that I have when I left ballet. Cause it was like, well, Oh, it's over. I failed. <laughs> you know? yeah. Clearly but, didn't succeed at that. Let's move on. Right. Right. <laughs> and I just think that the more that people could see that all the paths that they take, all the experiences that they have culminate into what it is that they have to offer, what it is that they have to share and help people with really. Right. I mean, all of our experiences, including the negative ones are what then set us up to help someone else. Okay, well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much.